Well, I'm not an expert. I'm not an authority. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. And all this time, Kemper was able to seem normal. He even hung out at a bar across the street from the courthouse, making friends with policemen, trying to pick up information. They'd buy me a beer, I'd buy them a beer. Uh, casual relationships, but that was, I was poking around a little bit, trying to find some things out. I knew they wouldn't be privy to hot information, but there were some things that were bothering me, like were there any speculations on how they were dying? Did the cops like you? Like I said, a friendly nuisance. I got in the way, and it was deliberate. Again, friendly nuisances are dismissed. How did you get the knowledge to outsmart the police? Watching television. Believe it or not, Joseph Wambaugh, police story. Got some tremendous insights into not just the gimmicks, the actual things, the tidbits that you would pick up from their procedures, but the mechanics behind that, the logic behind it, was I would not allow myself to walk into even a potential trap of behavior. And one of those was talking about those crimes too much to people, initiating conversations about that. There was a uh, memorial service for two of the victims. Yes. Were you tempted to go? Yes. But? I'd uh, seen one too many episodes of one too many crime shows where that is one of the available resources for clues. Tracking down the attenders. Take one man taking pictures of the people there to eliminate his potential suspects. Some police department, now they actually came to your house to pick up a handgun. Sheriff's representatives. One of the detectives was upset because he heard I had a 44 Magnum pistol and was a convicted mental patient and he came to take the gun away and it was on uh, he and his sergeant detective. They were staking out the wrong house. It was across the street and I'm playing around with the car standing next to the gun in the trunk. They come over and ask me about, uh, excuse me sir, uh, do you know who lives in this house across the street here? Well, that house was 609 Harriet. You cross back over to this side into 609 Ord, and they were looking for me and didn't even know that, see what I mean? Bad news. Well, at any rate, we walk into the house to have them ask my mother about this other house, and I'm saying, hey, which 609 are you looking for? And they said, are you Ed Kemper? Yes. And it goes on. And uh, I needed to find out what they were looking for, the murder weapon, the 22 automatic or the 44 Magnum, and I don't want to advertise that I've got a whole bunch of guns. Uh, so I made a comment to, to divine between the two. And uh, I said, yes, quite a little gun, isn't it? And he retorted, a 44 Magnum, I hope so. And I said, okay, because that loaded 22 was under the front seat and guaranteed me an arrest right on the spot. And uh, 44 was in the trunk. I forgot that. I took him in the house, we went into my bedroom, and the closet doors open, and I have a high-powered rifle with a scope on it. You had some other stuff in the house, too, yes? Yeah. I had the personal effects and identification of the last two co-eds that had been murdered about two months before, right next to the guns in the closet, in a box. Could he have seen it? No. But when he arrested me for having all those guns and went through the rest of the closet looking to see if there were any pistols or anything else, he wouldn't have, couldn't have helped notice a purse, a book bag, and co-ed ID inside of those belonging to their two latest murder victims. I back up and said, oh, excuse me. I just remembered something. And instantly he responds to what I'm saying. My hand moves. Back we go outside. And he's still thinking, boy, this is a really nice and helpful guy here. Why did you wind up giving yourself up? It had to stop. It had to stop. Uh, once my mother was dead, there was almost a cathartic process at that point. I got physically ill right then, when she died, when I murdered her. And once she was dead, there was no way I could back out. I had backed down from giving up a thousand times. You know, I used to get drunk and go sit out in front of the sheriff's department in a parking lot across the street on one of those little concrete parking berms. And I'd just sit there and say, no, I still can't. The clanging doors, I can still hear them. No, because it'll never open again. You know, so I, I 
I uh, rationalized that to give up would be insane. To give up would be crazy. I'd be giving away my freedom, and I don't need to. But I look back on that and wish I had earlier when I was saying those things to myself. The people who were later dead wouldn't be. The regret that came later would have not had to be. Those people, not things, those people would still be with their families, with their loved ones. They would have their own families. If I had had the courage to make that decision, instead of painting myself into the corner. Where might you be if you'd never given in to the impulse to murder? Where might I be? If my parole had been successful, uh, I believe I'd be married, I'd have children, I'd be heading toward my first grandchildren.